Okay. So we'll talk about recursion. This is meant to be a little more introductory, even though we don't have any beginners here. But so we'll move quickly and feel free to talk, ask questions, comment, correct. <laughs> As things come up, who am I? I already told you guys about myself. Elliot Cameron, I'm VP of Technology at Graphs It In. We're a really small company. Uh, and I'm um, sort of starting the Haskell story there. Okay. So, recursion, what is it? It's actually kind of hard to define. I looked it up um, from many sources. <laughs> <laughs> With, yeah, <laughs> Wikipedia, you know, dictionary. And uh, basically, it's more like an idea than like a strictly defined thing. Um, but summarizing all the definitions I found, it's essentially something whose identity is self-referential. So if you look at this picture of Mona Lisa, the actual picture itself, if you're trying to dis define the picture, you have to refer to the picture in your definition. This is a picture of a woman holding a picture of a woman holding a picture of a woman holding a <laughs> Like you'd have to do that. That's not the only way to, to define that picture. So like uh, in in a graph, you might have a node that's pointing to itself. So you have this kind of this kind of loop idea. And in mathematics, you can you can define recursive things like x equals f of x. So x is on both sides of the equation, um, which means it depends on itself. So there's actually some a lot of examples of recursion are just in nature, in our world. One would be um, a food chain, for example. And I noticed that a recursion, a lot of times it depends on what, like, what level of abstraction you're talking about. Because you wouldn't be able to say, uh, for example, a shark is recursive in terms of sharks. Sharks don't eat sharks. But carnivores are sort of recursive because carnivores do eat carnivores, right? So that's a high level of abstraction. So sometimes things that aren't, aren't recursive in the particular. And the particular are in the abstract, right? Or vice versa sometimes. Um, so yeah. And then um, obviously we as humans are, can be defined recursively. <laughs> you are the product of your parents who are the product of their parents or the product of their parents or the product of their parents. Um, yeah, this is a funny picture. <laughs> it's, it's the types though, not the, not the, not the, not the particular <laughs> values. Yes, well, you could, but you could say that, for example, a uh, human, you can't define a human without talking, like, okay, holistically. Like, you can, if you're talking about particular features of a human, yes, you don't have to talk about recursion. If you're trying to define the entirety of human, you would have to involve the ability for humans to create humans, right? Would, would that be an endomorphism? Yes. <laughs> right. Learn something. Well, yeah, depending on, yeah, A to A, so... Um, and then fractals are also a form of recursion. So this is interesting. These are really interesting shapes that the cone with nodules, where each nodule is a cone with nodules, where each cone is, you know, it goes on and on. Um, those are very interesting. Uh, a lot of mathematical studies on these. So basically what I want to talk about is uh, just a basic introduction to recursion. Um, for people who don't quite have a good grasp of it, we'll talk about co-recursion, folds, unfolds, and then we'll talk about some some just uh, tangential topics, like uh, well, not really tangential, but uh, tail recursion, uh, especially in Haskell, which is kind of it's kind of hairy in Haskell, and then uh, the Y combinator, which leads us into just a tip, just touching that tip of the iceberg of recursion schemes. So let's just start in. Um, so as you're probably all aware. Uh, recursion is somewhat foreign idea in traditional imperative programming. Um, you, like you learn about it in school, but you don't like you never use it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just never use it, right? Literally, Unless you're walking a directory, you know. Directory. Like doing a, like no, like a ls. Uh, yeah. Like looking at directories oh, contents. Directory. Yeah, recursively deleting items in a directory or something. The root list. That's like the only time you'd ever yeah. <laughs> use, even then, you'd probably, most naive programmers would probably try to write it with a loop first and fail miserably, because uh, it's very, very hard. 
Um, but yeah, I remember learning about recursion in school, and I don't think I ever used it. <laughs> so imperative programmers, they love loops. Everything's a loop. Um, so some, there's some interesting characteristics about loops. There's not really a clear identity to a loop. Like if you're talking about this for loop, but if, tell me what someone tell me what this for loop does. It's obvious. Yeah. C plus plus. It uh, prints out one through ten, basically. Um, there's not it, there's not a clear identity. Uh, what I mean by that is this is not an expression. You can't refer to this loop like as a whole. You can copy and paste it. You can tweak pastes, but you can't refer to the loop itself. Pass, you can't pass it around, it's not first class. Um, that makes it very hard to abstract. Obviously there's no self-reference, which is partly because that doesn't have a name, it doesn't have an identity, so you can't refer to it. And it involves mutation. You have got I++, it means that I is actually changing in every iteration. And the only thing I have to say about mutation is that. <laughs> <laughs> we all know what happens when you mutate. You end up with mutants. <laughs> <laughs> Mutation makes mutants. <laughs> <laughs> Go away with that one thing. <laughs> so in functional programming, at least purely functional programming, we don't even have loops. Because we don't have mutation. Because we don't have mutation. Exactly. We like recursion. So this is a very this is not how you'd write this if you were if you knew anything about Haskell, but this is recursive, so that helps me talk about it. So basically if you wanted to print all the numbers up to ten. You've got, uh, you take a number n, a starting point, and if n is greater than 10, we do nothing. We return, it's sort of the void case. And then, um, otherwise, we print n and then call ourselves. Of course, this is very verbose. You can also do it like this. <laughs> if anyone's like, oh, it's so verbose. Well, Haskell can be very This one cool. looks like a loop, too, though. Yeah, this one actually looks like a loop. The funny thing is, in Haskell, oops, I lost that. I didn't mean to do that. Um, in Haskell, loops are just special cases of recursion. So that's okay. M makes it okay. <laughs> um, so let's talk about recursion, what the characteristics. First of all, in this case, it has a name, right? So you can talk about this loop, um, talk about this recursion. You have, therefore, you can refer to yourself. So you see this print up to 10 at the bottom, referring to itself. Uh, there's no mutation, which makes it very easy to abstract. And there's obviously um, a couple core comp components to recursion. There's a base case, which is basically a non-recursive case. You don't call yourself in that case. And then you have the recursive case. If you have those two things, you have sensible recursion. You can actually have recursion without the base case. But you have to be very careful, because <laughs> that basically be an info loop. There's also the idea of mutual recursion, where you're not directly referring to yourself, but you're referring to somebody else who refers to you. And that can be many levels deep, right? It can be 10 levels deep. You can have many different, I'm showing two nodes, you could have 10 nodes that refer to each other in different complicated ways. Um, is any from, anyone familiar with Escher, the artist? Yeah. He talked a lot about that. The famous book, Girdle, Escher, and Bach, which I thought was sort of I've never read it, but I really I want to. I read like the first four chapters of it. You did? Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really monumental. It's, <laughs> it's big, yeah. I've heard. Yeah, maybe we should make it a group thing. I heard they're doing it as a group thing in DC. Right now they're just having a little girl lecture box music. Yeah. Dude, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I'd love to read it. Yeah. I'll stand to it. Yeah, the, the idea of that being that, at least one of the ideas there is that this idea of loops appear, not just in mathematics, but also in art and music. And some of these geniuses of the past discovered that. So an example in real life of a, of a mutually recursive relationship is binary stars. They're, they're, they are revolving around each other, which means their gravitational effects depend on each other. Um, and also a common example in programming would be like a, a parser, where you can have an expression which refers to a uh, um, but basically, expressions can refer to terms, which can be expressions, which can be terms, which can be expressions, right? So you got that idea. And some common tools that we use, we often uh, use recursion without knowing it, especially in Haskell. <laughs> so 
So the basic one that you use is it's called a fold. In other places, it's known as a reduce or an aggregate, something like that. And um, they basically just work on recursive slash inductive data structure. Induct has anyone done like uh, proofs? So induction, familiar with induction? Yeah. So you got yeah, the base I think case. Of induction is a recursive thing, essentially. Yeah, they are. I think I didn't say that because yeah. I was afraid that they are. I could say induction is a special case of recursion, like because it is a little more. Yeah, I think induct induct like an inductive proof technique is a special case of recursion. Yeah, um, and I'm even a little after researching. I'm even a little afraid of saying recursion sometimes because there's different types of recursion. And when we say recursion, actually we could be referring to one of two different types. Um, so this is a fold R, right? And it's defined recursively. As you can see, there's fold R on the right side of the equation. Um, I'm sure, most of you are familiar with fold R. And you can use fold R to basically define almost any <laughs> anything you would want. Some product ID on lists. Um, so just basically, uh, it basically captures the idea of a loop in a functional language. Uh, maps. So we have map reduce, the idea. Map, that's actually map. So reduce, when, you, when they talk about map reduce, they're talking about map and fold, but even though... But maps are folds, so they're really just talking about folds. Because <laughs> um, a map is just a fold where you basically take an input list, reconstruct the exact same list, but apply a function to every element. But I bet a lot of people don't think of maps as recursive at all. You know? A lot of people who are just saying it's both some kind of programming, the recursion will just be there. Yeah. And they, say, and they would understand if you showed them that definition of fold. You know, like, see how it's recursive. And you walk through like how syntax would have been, and then it'd be like that's oh yeah that's definitely recursive. But I think it's kind of mind blowing for people when they first realize that a map can be written in terms of a fold, and then a map yeah. is like a recursive action. Yeah. And then dealing with lists in general. Is I think that's a really good exercise in school. Yeah, yeah, we can do some of these. Multiple uh, Haskell constructs or something like that. Is there? You would probably if you were actually going to implement map with a fold, you'd probably use fold l prime. Like a I mean, actually, you, yeah, you probably wouldn't. No, I mean, you could do the full thing. There you have it right there. Yeah, so this, this handles infinite inputs. Um, but if you're using full L, it can, it's still recursive. We'll talk about that. Uh, so it's going to be, well, in a strict language, it would definitely be faster. Um, we'll talk about tail recursion. Um, even filter is just a special case of a full. Because it, uh, if you think about map is a function that that uh, from a to b so it can uh, it can change some a to b but filter basically is from a to maybe a essentially or b is maybe a uh, so you can take things out um, and if you apply both of them you get some sort of hybrid thing like uh, map maybe or something which can remove and transform <laughs> So you can even define filters. So we're also going to talk about something called co-recursion, which is pretty neat. Um, so if you can talk about two different types of recursion, you have folds. We talked about folds, and they always start with some list or some structure of many, and they reduce it down to a single sort of result, which can actually be a list. But the, the, the idea is of direction is sort of reducing, taking something big and thinking it's small. Uh, like a sum would be a, a fold. So you're starting from many and down to one. And there's something called an unfold where you start at the at some sort of base and you build up a structure from that. Um, it's kind of hard to find examples of that because um, to start from some base and deterministically create uh, a structure from that, I, you have to have everything in the yes. first note, like everything that would create it. Yeah, the base that, like, if, if you're saying sum, right, 10, if, you, if you're starting at 10, well, there's an infinite number of ways to get to 10. So your unfold could actually be uh, a list, an infinite list of every possible way to get to 10. That would be a, a conceivable unfold. But I'm not a practical one. <laughs> Why would you use that? Iterate. Yeah. You're just an unfolding list. Yes. Linearly, though. The you mean the iterate function? or? Yeah. Like, Yes, iterate actually is an example of one. Yeah. 
But it, but it doesn't do this. That new. No, yeah, it's does something else. Yeah. So here's an actual example of, of recursion versus local recursion of the same function, and it's really this is an interesting um, exercise to think about the Fibonacci sequence. You can define it recursively, traditionally, like the um, as in as in using a, a fold. Um, right? Yeah. So recursion sort of maps to folds, and co-recursion is the idea of an unfold. I know, so what you're saying here is the reason why you would call this co-recursion is because, like, when you're unfolding, um, uh, when you're unfolding the Fibonacci here, you're kind of zipping, you're kind of bumping between these two, these yeah. two sources. You're starting with a base, uh, and you're deterministically creating. You're unfolding it into the rest. But here you have two. You have two. Uh, yes, it's that would still be considered. Yeah, fibs is an instant li infinite list. It would still this be tail fibs. Tail fibs is as well. Yeah, this would still be considered a form of co-recursion, basically because you you are not uh, reducing but expanding out. Does that make sense? So instead of so the top one takes some number and tr and and hands you back the Fibonacci of that number. The bottom one doesn't you doesn't take a number. It starts with zero and one and creates all the Fibonacci numbers. Does that make sense? Recursively. <laughs> That's why it's co-recursive. Because it unfolds into the entire Fibonacci sequence. Both of them return, uh, well, can be used to get the right result. With Fibs, at the bottom, you have to like index into the list, right? Like pick the tenth one. Um, both of them get you the same answer, but one of them is exponential <laughs> in performance, and one of them is constant, well, uh, linear but it runs in constant space. So different structures and algorithms lend themselves to different types of recursion, co-recursion versus recursion. And, and uh, sometimes defining it co-recursively makes the problem much easier to solve. When you're thinking about recursively, you're like, oh, just flip it around to co-recursion, and all of a sudden it's simple, like in the famous example. Um, So I'll talk about tail recursion um, briefly, and um, tail recursion is actually kind of hairy and uh, Haskell because, um, well, we get there. So I, I, my understanding of tail recursion is that that is how a infinite recursion can be referred to in some fashion. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. Than just like full on stack. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I, you're, you think you're right. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So the difference between these two functions, the, the one on the left is the one that we had before, just prints from through 10. Can anyone tell me what the one on the right does? <laughs> no, no, it actually doesn't. Well, okay, pick, and it goes only goes to 10. If n is greater than 10, it returns. So pick uh, print stack one. Um, so if one of them is one, two, or something like that. Yeah, it prints. Um, one, one, two, three. It, I'll, I'll just, actually, I'll just run it. No, 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 sorry. It prints blue, one, two, like the, the, the one from triangle. triangle. Yeah, it prints triangle. There you go. It okay. kind of. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, nine, seven, six, five. Eight. Here, I will type it in so that this is. I, I, I've got it right here, actually. <laughs> you want to play for it? Yeah, I got it right here. As long as my, oh, my screen got on. Up. So you can see that. Oh, just up to the top of the back. Yeah. yeah. Because it because yeah, there's one on this side and one on that side. Exactly. So if you're looking at uh, this, mm -hmm. you've got to print and then you call recursively. So you do the next stack and then you print at the end. So this one's not um, tail recursive because. These transitions are kind of slow. <laughs> they keep messing me up. Oh, I should just get rid of them. Because they're so slow, I hit the... Yeah, they're very monumental. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hit the key, and then it's like, oh, I'm going to queue up and move. Okay, so the tail recursive one, it's the, the recursive call is the absolute last thing that you do in the recursive case. So you can see that the very last thing we do in print up to 10 is print up to 10. And the other one, we do something after the fact. So it's not the tail of the recursion. 
Then we have to hold on to some doofus mix. Yeah, so in a in a uh, strict language or a typical language, uh, the difference between these is uh, well, in, in either case, in a standard language, without tail call, without this optimization, basically every time you call into a function, you create a stack, uh, entry of a stack, right? So every every recursive call is a new memory overhead, performance overhead, and you can only go so deep before you run out of memory, right? Whereas a loop, because it's actually modifying the counter in place and it's jumping, you know, in the assembly, there's no additional stack frame. So it doesn't incur any additional overhead. And so you're saying in a strict language, um, both of these, both of these would blow the stack for high numbers. Yeah. For low, actually in this case, low numbers, <laughs> like negative a million or something. You go up to ten. Um, but yeah, it'd blow the stack because it keeps adding this. So what they typically do is they have something called tail call optimization or tail call elimination, elimination, where if the last thing you do is call yourself. They can basically just turn that into a loop because it's the last thing you do. Because it can translate that, and like the yeah, it compile the, the compiler does it for you. It oh, translates yeah. it into a loop. So it's, it's just simple for it to just write a loop. Pretty right, but if there's if it's doing something after the fact, it's it's it's, it's almost kind of like a, well, I'm just gonna say it's like inlining, but um, yeah, it's sort of like inlining. If you were to inline. The recursive calls, you'd be the exact same every time, right? Because you'd have, because you're calling yourself at the end. So you're just like, it's just this block of code times 10. Well, it's really I just know. a while loop. Right? Yeah, it's a while loop yeah. or a for loop. I know how to do this block of code times 10. However, if you're doing something after the fact, like we're doing with the, with the printing. Then you built up that stack in the original place you chose that. Yeah, you can't just copy paste because now you need to do something after it. So now you're creating a weird, and, that, and that's a simple, this is a simple case. Um, but your compiler doesn't know what your stack was that you built up, so it can't just like code that into a loop for you. No, yeah, and it has to keep track of the stack because it's going to continue. It's going to continue from where it left left off as it unrolls, right? So when we get down to the second print end in a traditional language, it it needs to know what n is, for example, in that stack frame. So it has to keep that stack around because <laughs> after it returns from print stack, it needs to continue from there. Um, so that's what I wish it was like a global setting to turn these off. Cool when you're working on the slideshow. I'm not so cool when you're using it. <laughs> um, yeah, so th they use this this technique to kind of get rid of it. Um, and just FYI, left folds uh, at least in Haskell are tail recursive, and right folds are not. But when, when you say they are tail recursive, what do you mean? That means that if you're looking at the source code for, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Yeah. Okay. You're saying that. Left folds are are optimized with tail recursion, but right folds are not optimized. No, what I'm saying is that uh, let's just look at it. It's like a fold L. There it is. Is this right? Hi you. 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 That's funny. Fold R prime isn't the terms of fold L. Where are you, fold L? Oh, goodness. Okay. This is definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so that's great. We, we'll talk about I need like the. <laughs> I don't remember. This is not going to help us. <laughs> I just need like the standard uh, <laughs> implementation for list. What was endo for? I can't remember. I think the name is. If endo A is the same as A to A, basically. How about the base code? Oh. Or it's not This one here? It's endo. Yeah. Oh, it's still got T in there, which means it's going to be all awesomeified. I really just want it on list. How do you get the basic one back? Oh, okay. Well, we can probably implement it ourselves, but I don't. You want to do an exercise and implement it ourselves? All right, let's do it. So, here is why it is tail recursive. <laughs> because look at fold R. The recursive call 
happens, and then we apply x to the result. Sorry, we apply f to the result of so the it's recursive not, call. That's not, not that's not to recursive. However, this one we call f, and then loop, then fold. So the last thing we do is call ourselves. So it's still recursive. So that means it can be optimized using tail using using tail recursive uh, elimination. However, we're going to talk about that next. Which is so it's not like better by itself. It's because of the optimization of the title that it could possibly. Be. Yeah, right. Well, that's, that's, this is interesting. But, but now Haskell is different. So Haskell, where are we? Here we go. So um, the common question is, does Haskell have TCO? Well, the thing is, it's kind of complicated because Haskell has laziness. Uh, which kind of changes the, the whole spectrum because um, we don't have call stacks. <laughs> Haskell doesn't really have call stacks at all. So tail caller optimization, the whole point of it is to not have call stacks, is to reduce the need for a call stack in a loop, recursive case. But Haskell doesn't even have call stacks. It has thunks. Which are just like stuff that I won't evaluate. Yeah, stuff that I haven't done yet, basically, yeah. yeah. Stuff I have, just like everyone else. Yeah, well, my to-do <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah. Right. So expression. So you're actually just building up an expression that gets reduced, and uh, it's actually very much the, the entire uh, evaluation model in Haskell is very much like the idea of a generator or a coroutine. Okay. Just, just like, very much just like, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Python. But Python has generators. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I was gonna say that just kind of, kind of feels like it makes it more complicated. It's kind of like everything else, where like you know, you have a library of books and you just haven't opened them yet. Like it's just like it's just work that you haven't done. Yeah, and it, it, your entire, you know, like with with your main block, with your main, it's an IO monad. You know, it's an IO do block. It, it's really just an expression of expressions that are sequence defined, right? And you're just sort of grabbing one. Evaluating it to weak head normal form. Well, until you until you have everything you need, and if it, if that demands something else, uh, well, the first thing you probably grab is bind. So you grab bind, and bind needs the left argument, so you evaluate the left side of the bind, and then it needs the right side of the argument, so you evaluate the right side of the bind and math pass that value through. Right. So it's just it's just sort of generating values in like this giant um, co-recursive loop, basically. So uh, you can you can model this idea like in Python using generators. So you'll see like here's a here's an infinite uh, recursive function in Python that's lazy. And I don't, if you're familiar with Python, this makes more sense. But you you call this function, what you get back is a generator. And if you grab a value off of it, you get start. And if you grab a value again, you get infinity star plus one. If you grab a value, so just but this function right here, even though it's um, infinitely recursive on, on itself, it doesn't build up any stack. So that's kind of how Hi uh, Haskell works for everything, not just for generators. <laughs> um, so tail call optimization doesn't really, it's, it's sort of simultaneously never applied and always applied, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's yeah. like always there versus it's never what, there. What is so interesting about this though is that, like, is, that, um, is that people will think that Haskell's really weird, and that it's like too hard to understand. But honestly, like the um, the analogy here is much more natural to like our everyday lives than um, than like stacks are. Like you actually have to, have to go to the trouble of learning like what, how a computer works or how an imperative computer works in, in terms of, or strict strict processing how it works because it like comes up with all these things you have to do. But honestly, like the life that you live in right now has a million things that you won't do until you do them. Yes. You don't have to do until you do them until you decide to do them. Like, I mean, like, we live in infinity, and, and there's an infinite life ahead of us, and there's no, like, pressure on us to do any of these things. They're just there. <laughs> you do them on demand, right? <laughs> right, yeah. And that's just kind of the same way. I mean, like, there's, just, there's all these things that are around. Like, um, like there's a like there's a bookshelf of books that you were supposed to read, but you don't yeah. have to read them. They're just sitting there. But And, and reading one might force you to read another. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you might actually read the other and be like, I don't understand this. So I'll read this other one. Yeah. But if you never started the first one, you'll yeah, so the, the, the thunks can, will create other thunks in the process, right? And, that's, and that builds up this sort of exp, um, 
space of thunks that you're constantly eating out, eating out of, right? So tail call uh, optimization, uh, you can say it's it sort of applies, but not really because uh, um, specifically there's this idea of a guarded recursion, which is basically just laziness applied to recursion, where the recursion only happens on demand, right? That's the idea of this of this yield. Um, in a strict language, when you call a recursive function because it's strict, it actually calls itself. Let's say it's a, let's say it needs to walk a directory. Your first the first time you say walk this directory, it walks all it walks, it walks everything. It starts and it goes to the next one, it goes to the next one. This is all strict. So it's evaluating the entire recursive structure, the entire recursive algorithm right then and there. All the way to the bottom. And then it comes back. Does that make sense? In Haskell, it all it basically just gives you a thunk, okay, yep, I'll start that whenever you're ready. <laughs> and then it just eats things off of that stack of that essentially a, a stack of to-dos. So here's an example of actual um, how it's evaluated. So here's a factorial function defined non-tail recursively, but what you can see is um, there's, no, there's no stack involved. It's purely re reduction. So you start without fact five. Well, fact five is defined as five times fact four. Um, the number on the left is forced because you have to compare against one. Does that make sense? Fact one equals one. So the left, the left side of the le the first argument of fact is uh, strict because it has to be compared against one. So you have to reduce it. Does that make sense in normal form. Does that make sense to people? Otherwise, you you literally have fact of five equals fact of five times fact of four. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So, but you're you're reducing five. Um, you keep reducing on the way down. So fact. Of four is four times back of three, which is five times four times three times back of two, right? So there's no stack. You're just building up the structure, and then, and then you're uh, evaluating the thunks in the way. But down. instead of st stack, yeah. you just have a really, really long. Yeah, this is the other thing. Model this stack. actually comes from a Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow ha, post about uh, how does Haskell handle this, and he said, well, tail call optimization doesn't actually doesn't help you in this case because you're building up thunks. So even though we're not building up a stack, like in a traditional language, we are building up a big intermediate structure. I mean, that's literally, that thing is literally a stack. Like, yeah, this, yeah. Be, or, it could, or it could be. It could but it's be not the stack, stack in the traditional sense of programming. Oh, no, like a programming of a programming call stack. Call stack. Right. It's, a, it's a stack of thunks. Like, as you move from one step to the other, you can throw away the previous step. That doesn't really go away. Right, but the one in the middle is, I mean, it's a pretty big yeah. stack. And then, like, and, then, and then if you pack 25 or 30, you're up 500. Yeah. Like, you have this huge. So what you can do in this case, for example, is you can um, make fact strict. Let's see, it is make. Uh, I think multiplication is lazy, either in both arguments or one of its arguments. If you make multiplication strict in both arguments, it would reduce down every time. Does that make yeah. sense? So you use fold l dot fold l prime. Yeah, you could use fold in this case. So there's instead. no fold l with the yeah, the strict fold l prime. Yeah, yeah. from data that list. Yeah. Some kind of dirty imperative thing. I mean, not not it's not imperative, but it uses something like that. So the next thing we'll talk about is uh, it's surprisingly related to recursion. I actually was surprised how related it was as I studied it. The problem with Y Combinator is that if you search for it on Google, <laughs> the only thing you find is Y Combinator, the company. <laughs> you have to like work at it to actually find the actual thing, Y Combinator. Uh, which is what their name yes, is. Yes, this is true. Yes, I, I Hacker News, true. yeah. <laughs> you find a million things about Y Combinator. Yeah. So, why the Y Combinator? <laughs> Here's a question for you. What if you want to use recursion in a lambda function, anonymous function? Uh, it's not like a basic part of the definition of Y Combinator. You have to have it. Yeah. Well, you can't. It doesn't have a name. It's no. anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So you can't refer to yourself. Yeah, you can't refer to yourself to do this recursive call. And this is a big problem for lambda calculus because lambda calculus only has lambdas. All right, that's all you have. I'm assuming some knowledge of lambda calculus here, but this was, I think, what sort of drove the problem because because uh, Church, you know, developed lambda calculus and it was awesome. And then you're like, well, how do you do recursion? Well, ah, 
<laughs> so now you have to construct a lambda that does recursion for you. Is that the idea? Yes. Well, actually, you can do recursion fairly e easily, um, but it's not general. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't get into the details of that, but there's not a general like solution for recursion. Um, so in our ex original example, if you just have a lambda and you're trying to call yourself, what do you do? How do you do that? So our hero, Haskell <laughs> Curry, he's actually the first one who developed, as far as I could tell, uh, the first one who came up with this idea of a Y Combinator. And the Y Combinator is essentially the solution, a general solution for doing recursion in a lambda calculator. Is this the is this the derivation that you're performing? No, this is the use. Uh, this is not the derivation. Oh, that's just using it. This is using it. I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Well, I want to see the derivation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your our summary says I'm going to go over SK, and I'm not. Uh, I found out that SK is actually just a different model of a different way of kind of talking about the same thing of lambda calculus. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go into that. Um, so that they, actually, he used this as his basis of the Curry paradox, which is a proof that untyped lambda calculus is unsound. <laughs> because if you have untyped uh, recursion like this, you can create infinite loops. And what you can do with infinite loops, uh, with, what you can do with infinite recursion, is basically prove anything. Um, so you can you can create inconsistency in your logic. But I don't. That's a, that's a side topic. The point is, he made this thing. So that's like brutal. Yeah, yeah, he's dem he's demonstrating that if it's consistent, if, if it's consistent with anything you create, then it just means it means it's a uh, complete loop. Exactly. Yep, that's Curry's paradox, I think, or at least part of it. Um, so this is just a use case down here. This is directly copied from Wikipedia. But so y takes a function g, and then does this crazy thing such that the result of applying y to g is g y of g. Does that make sense down here at the bottom? This is, is, uh, this is the result. y of g is g y of g. So it moves the g to the outside and then keeps it on the inside. So it's basically injecting g into itself and getting this back out. So this is g applied to y of y. Yeah, g applied to y of y. Um, and why, uh, why that's significant is, well, what happens if you <laughs> apply that again? So you get G of G of Y of G, right? If you do that again, you have G of G, and you just keep going. So that, that's recursion. Um, so you're taking this, this, this G function, um, basically sort of in, like dependency injecting it almost into this expression, which gives you that function on the outside and applies it to yourself. And so the keep question going. is like, does Y G terminate it yeah, it's a big well. In, in, so the question, yeah, so that's what the, we're going to what the a fixed point is. So if if y of g equals g of y of g, when does it ever stop? That's the question. Well, sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> right? If g is id, then it's just going to keep expanding, expanding. It's going to diverge, basically, which means it doesn't ever terminate. Because it just y expands. Is not a value, it doesn't it's a function. Yeah. So g is a function. If g is just id, then it just keeps expanding, expanding. Um, now, I, that doesn't mean that if, if G was ID, I think you could say that this really whole thing was ID, but the point is the expression would expand. But you can have functions that do terminate, and we just talked about them. They're recursive, and they have base cases. And the base case uh, is also sort of known as a fixed point, because in mathematics, a fixed point is a point where uh, for some function of X, the result is also X. So that's what a fixed point is, f of x equals x. That's a fixed point of, of f. Because there's some function that, that, that leaves it the same. There's some value for the function that leaves the result the same. Oh, okay. So the fixed points are the points at which, on the, in the, sort of the drawing the function, right. where, the, where the input is the same as the output. Does that make sense? So for y, um, a, fixed, a fixed point for y would be a case where applying y to g of x is the same as just having g of x. See that g, y of g of x equal g of x. That's a fixed point of y, meaning that the input to y is the same as not applying y at all, just like with uh, f of x equals x. Hold on. The input to y is the same as not applying y. Oh, I think I'm missing some parentheses there. Yeah. Oh, well, not with well, not, Curry. Not, not with, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Curry. Yeah. Um. 
so yeah, if, so a fixed point is such is a place where basically applying f to a to a value is the same as not applying f at all, right? That's the fixed point. Um, so a fixed point for y would be a case where it's as if you didn't apply y. That's idempotent, meaning it doesn't matter how many times you do it, it'll never it'll never build up the structure anymore. And that's basically what your base case is. If you have a base case, you can apply the base case a thousand times and you always get the same result, right? If we're talking about fibs, like fibs, you know, or fibs of zero is zero. It'll always be zero. Um, so that's what a fixed point is. It's this place in the function, in the sort of y combinator space where the, where the y combinator doesn't have an effect. That means that for functions that have a base case, have a fixed point, if you apply y to them, they will terminate because they'll get to this point where they don't have any more effect and they stop expanding. Does that make sense? So here's an, so here's an example of actually using uh, a function in Haskell called fix, which is, fix is a function in Haskell which basically implements the idea of the y combinator. Um, Haskell is not as limited as lambda calculus, so it's much easier to implement in lambda uh, calculus. I mean, in Haskell, see, like, here's the implementation. Fix f equals let x equals f of x in x. That's one of the implementations. So because Haskell has a recursive wet, recursive wet, you can define it <laughs> this very interesting way. x equals f of x in x. You see that implementation there? Basically, it's um, x x equal. let x equal f of x in x. So it returns x, where x is f of x. And it can just figure that out so easily. Because it's lazy? Mm -hmm. And, well, yeah. If this was inf if this was infinite, then laziness would be nice. <laughs> so the first thing I did is I typed fix id, and it's like exception loop. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, if you do. Apparently, that's yeah, fix ID will not terminate. So one of the cool tricks that you can use, I actually saw this first in, in literally in MySQL bindings. <laughs> it was my first exposure to fix where Brian O'Sullivan actually uses fix to implement a loop in IOMonad. And here's an example of it. If you uh, call fix, mm -hmm. it basically, and you, and, you, and you give it a function with two arguments. Yeah. The first argument um, is a function which has the same type as the function I'm defining. It's basically myself. Because remember, y coming there takes g and passes g to itself. So the, I, I'm, it's, it's very hard to explain. I don't even know how to explain it very well. Um, I'm in the fix definition. How yeah. is the second x in scope? Because it's recur it has a recursive let. Haskell has recursive let, that's why. Could you also write that as x where? Yeah, well, x, x where x equals f of x. I'll just write it in Haskell. Let's see. Um, we'll call it fix2. Actually, I don't because I'm using. Um, oh, I need to say F here. I'm using uh, JCI. Oh, and they don't, it doesn't require JCI. I have no idea. Yeah, it doesn't mean I've been using LUTs by having clear knowledge. And I never even noticed. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of noobs, it's a very nice <laughs> feature. Yeah, I've been using it for a while, but I just had no idea it didn't even have to be LUTs, so I just never noticed. It's so weird. That's fucking weird. All right. So the type, it's very confusing. So the type of f is it takes a function from t to t, and then basically it, it continues to call that function on itself yeah. until you get one t back, right? So if that function from t to t is actually a function that takes two arguments, if t is, um, yeah, it's, let's see. So I have, I have this here, so I can, this is my, my expression. If I had this uh, found by itself, 
Um, let's see, Uber. Oh my, that's way too general. But <laughs> it, it's a T to IO. Um, it's a function from T to T. Do you see how it's a function from T to T? Well, up here. It's yeah. a function from A to A, because here's A and here's A. So it takes it takes a version of itself and returns uh, a version okay. of itself. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so that's still it, it matches the T to T. And if you uh, I just have it implemented in this file, so I can just call it. Um, if you call fix on that, it's, it needs to take itself in as an argument. It takes a counter in, which I'm using, and then it, since it, now since it's taking itself as an argument, it has a name for itself because I gave it one. I passed it in to fix. Oh, hello. It works. It actually works. It's pretty awesome, huh? Fix point is very. Trouble someone to the mind. Yeah, it, it works really well on computers. If you have, I, I see even another like fix the mind kind of like a workflow. Yeah, there's like a trick. I, actually, when I, the way I saw it, because right now you have to actually call print up to fix, which means you have to fame it. Right? You can do this cool trick where you uh, flip and fix, and then pass the first argument. So this flips it around so that it's taking n first. You pass n in, and then it performs fix. So now this doesn't, yeah, this does, you don't have to name it. So you can just do, this basically means while. <laughs> this is basically a while loop, where this is the condition. Where, it's not, a con I'm sorry, where whether or not you call loop is, is whether, is basically break, essentially, in a while loop. So in a, in a normal while loop, you'd say like while, you might say it might say something like while one in C, right? Actually, that's not C. And then you do blah 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 blah, and then if something break, I mean stop the loop. Well, in our case, that's essentially what we have. We have this forever loop. Um, as long as we call loop, it will continue looping. But if we don't call loop, it won't. So this is your base case. Where you're not touching loop, loop is not involved. Base case it is. Yeah, this is. But how can you go call ahead. flip on fix if fix only takes one argument? So fix is polymorphic from A to A, right? That's flip. That's uh, fix. Yeah. Um. So. In our case, the A is becoming is just polymorphing into whatever the signature of this of this of this function is, and this function's signature is from basically it's from int to IO. Uh, that's what it would be if I was just if I got rid of this, it'd be int to IO, but since I'm taking loop. It's from int to IO to int to IO. So it takes a function in and gives me a function back. Yeah, of course, these are redundant. I don't need them, but you can think of it this way. Right. So this is your A to A. Yeah. So I'm giving, given, given a version of myself, I'll give you back a version of myself that may or may not loop. <laughs> oh, you're asking how the flip works? Yeah. How can you how can you call flip on a function that takes one argument? If fix only takes one function or an argument, every function in the house takes one argument. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Every if this would probably make more sense to you if um if I did something like I can't even uh, what's confusing here is basically that you don't need it, currying is 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 very influential here. Because you're taking fit, flip, you're passing in a function, fix, from A, and you're this is this is what this is what flip is getting. It's flipping that around, so it's taking I let's see here. It's taking IO to A. 
Yeah, here it is. So here's here's what fix is um, receiving. This is the type that it that it poly or monomorphs to or whatever. Um, so it's actually so this after you apply fix to this, it's actually a two function argument. This one. So here's your first argument, which is loop. Here's your second argument, which is int. So by flipping this, you would turn this into this. Where it takes the int first and then takes the itself. So you're, you're flipping fix one, not fix one. So wouldn't you need progressive values only? Yeah, I think, I think like this. Um, that's essentially what it means. Yeah, that's what it means. Yeah. But you don't have to because it's going to do one argument at a time, figure out its type, pull the next argument, fill it in, and still have to fix Yeah, it. what's confusing is the polymorphism going on because yeah. what's this is not a one function argument. Fix is a polymorphic function. Oh, okay. Take a look at this. It's, split fix demands that, that the type of the A yes yes exactly okay. it, it must work that way it's the only way it can work you just type flip fix in it it's type of phd oh so flip fix automatically infers that it must be a two argument function yeah that a must the be a, a function a yeah in the fix yes yeah, so that makes sense the a must be a b to c that's right. right so it's so this A becomes a B to C, and then it puts the B in the term. This should be working in my house. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those cases where... Well, this is every time I discover it. <laughs> you, the other one that's classic for that one is just com composition. Yeah, no, I, no I, t I tweet about it every time I discover that thing again. I'm just like, <laughs> this blows my mind again. Composition, when it polymorphs, is yeah. insane. It's like mind blowing. Okay. Oh, it's that thing again, right? Yeah. That's not what it was for me. Every time I've sent, like, really? <laughs> yeah. It might take me five or ten times. All right. So now we're just going to barely touch on the top of tip of recursion schemes because fix is the entry point to that. So a question, uh, a point, data types can also be recursive. So you here you have a list, your list type, where list is defined in terms of itself. You have a cons cell with something in it with the rest of the list defined in terms of yourself. Or you can be empty, right? Everyone's familiar with this sort of canonical definition. Well, can you do the fixed point trick with types? Of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> you can create a type level fix function. Here, here it is, new type f, f fix f equals fix f of fix of f. Is that, this, the, the, the right hand side should be like screaming y combinator at you. Let's look at it's the exact same. It's applying f to fit, applying a fix to f gives you back f on the outside of that same expression. Okay, you can move the recursion to the left side. Yeah, and the cool thing about this is you can basically abstract over recursion. Yeah. So you can remove recursion, that sort of hard-coded recursion from your algorithm, from your structures. So here you have data list f, which is sort of the standard name. Abstract to fold. Why not abstract all of recursion? Just abstract recursion <laughs> entirely. <laughs> Where like, R... Basically, like, this is a fold for types. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the, um, the, where, the, where this comes from is a uh, Edward commit package called recursion schemes. And uh, it's the module is data dot foldable or something like that. Um, so R here is where we're injecting essentially the the recursive case, um, and then the library recursive uh, recursion schemes has all these cool tools that basically, if you just apply down here, we can get back the exact same list type that we had above by just applying fix to list f. So list f does not have any recursion. If you apply fix to it, just like we're in our loop example, you actually get a recursive type back. 
where R has been removed. Does that make sense? Um, and what this allows you to do is abstract over recursion so that anything even vaguely recursive can be now described in, the tame, in terms of the same combinators and the same tools. And those combinators and tools, common ones, are called, there's tons of them. And I don't even understand, like, barely these three. Catamorphisms, anamorphisms, and hylomorphisms are like the most common three. Let's read through it slowly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a catamorphism is a generalized fold. Yes. Anamorphism is a generalized fold. Cat, because you're putting it together. Anna, because you're taking it apart. Yeah, um, that's a good point. A hylomorphism is an anamorphism followed by a cat. Don't just not read it. It's not to fold, right? So it's 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 well, a it's it's a it's an unfold. Unfold followed, followed by, by a fold. Followed by a fold. So it takes so some it's an accordion. Takes some yeah, it's an accordion. It takes some seed, builds it out, and then then consumes it back. Um, there's a lot more. I think this is where you start getting into things like the zygohistoprepamorphisms. Like, <laughs> is that a real thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least it involves some of those pre uh, those prefixes. I probably botched it, but yeah, this is where you start to get these really funny words that make you sound I'm like a genius or like a complete out of your mind. You would ever hear co-recursive production followed by recursive consumption. So you're saying the anamorphism is co-recursive, but the catamorphism is just plain single recursive? Yeah, so because remember, unfolds are co-recursive, meaning they, they build a structure up. Right. So anamorphisms, because they're a generalized unfold, are co-recursive. They start so, with some seed and build up. I'm sorry. Is this related to the lens library? Because this sounds to me just like, like catamorphisms. One yes. <laughs> Everything's involved. In like, you might be right. I actually. David's the guy to ask for that. I don't either, actually. Because, like, when. Like, it's which one did you say was which? Which one's the prism? Um, anamorphisms. And you want to use them again. Oh, that makes sense. Because anamorphisms. Because prisms, you, you start with a single structure and you can. Get, yeah, project get many out of Yeah, and like sense. when Patrick gave that lens talk on the last day of Minicon, like I missed it because I was okay. Yeah. Well, but like my big takeaway from him presenting that was that lenses are basically more specific kind of folds. They're folds with more logs, essentially. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. You, when you're taking some kind of big data structure and you're pulling a single data data point out of it. And that's the same thing that you're doing with folds. You're you're taking something that is foldable and you're reducing it to a single kind of thing yeah. that is somehow in there somewhere. And with lenses you just have more laws about that well, you can 